Do you think that, uh, for, say, for religious historians, and in particular American religious historians in this case, I wonder if, if it'd be possible to apply some of the insights of neuroscience to even subjects that we study from the 1850s or the 1750s. You know, there might be certain, well, there would be cues that someone would say uh, an epileptic or mm -hmm. had some kind of a disorder that would be manifest in their religious experience. Do you think that that would be possible or would, would it be too difficult to, to span that vast time? I think it is possible and even probable. You know, I don't want to o o overstate the case, but uh, I think a historian of religions and a comparative religionist should be interested in the neuroscience of religious experience because take, for example, um, something I've been interested in for a while, these are what, what um, some scientists call is ecstatic cults. You see them down through the centuries. Every single religious tradition has some component of that going on. And in Christian context, it's sometimes called uh, you know, the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or spirit possession phenomena, glossolalia, uh, but some sort of ecstatic religious experience. And <clears throat> um, w one way to understand the content of those ecstatic experiences get a handle on it and predict where you're going to get them and how they shape ideologies and dogmas and doctrines is by studying how the brain mediates these experiences because there's there's only a certain set of constrained ways that the brain does so you we know that because we can see how drugs um, all the drugs in the hallucinogenic class, for example, they affect the brain in a very specific way, and then the experiences people report when they're on these sorts of hallucinogens um, um, repeat certain patterns. You know, so there's a phenomenology of ecstatic experiences that always occurs when you when you activate the brain in that specific way, even even visualizations, right? Because yeah. uh, like visual hallucinations that you see in in Paleolithic art, spirals. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I visited Newgrange, uh, one of these sites in, uh, in Ireland. Yeah. In Ireland, there were all these spirals all over the place. There were all these specific designs that yeah. you see repeated in one area or another across the, yeah. the globe. David Lewis Williams um, and many other people now developed a, a, what he calls the neuropsychological theory of these these geometric patterns that, that are repeated over and over again in um, Neolithic art and in Paleolithic cave art mm -hmm. and in rock art in southern Africa. So, you know, all over the world you get this the same sort of visual phenomena, geometric patterns, and then this tunnel phenomena and Hmm. and uh, same sorts of um, theory anthropotes, you know, the, the human-animal combinations right. start to appear. Even and at the temple, the oldest one that's been discovered recently, the one that's in modern-day Turkey, oh, yeah. that dates back to 11,000 yeah. years ago. You, there. you see them on the big pillars there. Yeah. And, and, and that apparently wasn't even a village. That's, that yeah. was a ritual center. There was it, it predates pottery. It predates yeah. We're we're talking way and, back. Yeah, right at the transition of Paleolithic to Neolithic, you know. So and many people have um, put these sorts of visual um, experiences within the context of this category shamanism. You know, who knows whether or not shamanism, quote unquote, captures it all. All we know is that it does occur across religious contexts across the world and across across time epochs. Mm -hmm. And when you <clears throat> create the conditions, either via drugs or via all kinds of ascetical practices or sensory deprivation, um, you get the same sort of um, reports of visual experiences, hallucinations, and emotional experiences. And so you, you know, people will actually uh, paint 
the same sorts of designs you see on New Grange and on cave art and rock art and so on. You know, so the, it, it is legitimate, it seems to me, to say when you stimulate the brain a certain way, you're going to get a certain range of experiences that are interpreted religiously, especially in religious contexts. And so the brain, historically, has is been a crucial factor in producing a, a, a range of religious ideologies that some people call shamanistic that persisted in, into the Neolithic and into the major world, into the streams that produced the major world religions. Hey, even in um, the Vedic religions and in Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism, you know, in the Vedic religions and Hinduism, one of the sources was Soma, the mushroom Soma. And that was when it was produced in a brew that they used, it was hallucinogenic. And same with Haoma in the Zoroastrian context. Mm -hmm. So some of these major Axial Age religions also used hallucinogenic brews in their sacrificial rites. And we know that that's the case in some of the Aztec and Mayan religions as well. So there's been no, there's, there's no question that human beings from from the Paleolithic right up into the Axial Age, used hallucinogenic brews in their religious rites. And that influenced, to some extent, not totally, but to some extent, the ecstatic versions of those religious streams, mm -hmm. which in turn influenced the orthodoxy. So, you know, and the brain is crucial, obviously, in, in that whole story. You want to understand the phenomenology of those ecstatic experience, you've got to understand the brain, the contribution of the brain. Have you, did you hear about these studies that are being done at Johns Hopkins with um, mushrooms recently? It was probably about two years ago. They reinitiated re uh, some of the studies with, um, uh, with mushrooms. Yes, and, I have heard about And that. religious experience. So they were, yes, <clears throat> and they which, did it in a double-blind way, a multi-site yeah. study. Which has a dicey history going back Definitely. to Harvard in the 60s. And, uh, and to Boston University, my home university, at the Marsh Chapel experience. Right. Yeah. yeah. What, for, in, in, in conclusion here, is there, are there any things that are sort of on the horizon for neuroscience, uh, neurobiology, that will help us better understand these religious experiences? Technologies or, or new f fields that are sort of emerging that maybe 20 years from now or 10 years from now will answer more questions for us? Well, I think um, it's fair to say that there is a definite new discipline emerging, and it, you know, people are calling it the cognitive neuroscience of religion, or the cognitive neuroscience of religious cognition. And it's, it's, there are many, many publications. There's going to be a new journal. I'll be one of the editors called Religion, Brain, and Behavior. Be, well, the first issue will be launched in September, uh, September of next year, so a year away, basically, a uh, year and a few months away. Um, there, there is a critical mass now for this new discipline that's emerging, the cognitive neuroscience of religion, and I intend to have the, the humanistic scholars inform it. I don't want it to be a repeat of reductionistic you know, simplistic approaches of just explaining religion away. Not explaining it, but explaining it away. It's nothing but this, nothing but that, nothing but delusion. Um, so this, this collaboration between the cognitive science, the neuroscientists, and religion scholars, the historians, the comparative religionists, the philosophers of religion, the theologians, people who really know religion, it's going to be a very, very powerful combination. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you um, speaking with me. My pleasure. Thanks.